My name is Quinton Lorena. I'm somewhat of a middleman in the criminal underworld. I mediate the crime families. I arrange diplomatic marriages. I keep things civil. But above all, I host auctions. Art is a tastefully wonderful medium of laundering money, and hosting both underworld and legal auctions is kind of my speciality, and I also recover and sell cursed artifacts. I'm not intending to talk about the people and things I deal with as the middleman here though. No, I'm talking in regards to a very odd painting a client wanted me to recover. This deal, like the majority of my deals, was a perfectly legal deal. It started with the woman in my office. I owned an auction house downtown, and it had been a chilly morning, with wind and fog deep in my breath. Only I had the key to the place, see, and when I saw the lock had been snapped clean, I shuddered with more cold air than fear, and entered, a small pistol in hand. There were things in my offices ordinary people would freak out on. Dealings with the family. Strange artifacts that did. Things the normals could never understand. Only good for laundering money. Loreno? A voice called out within my office. Old. Hoarse. I looked up to see an old grey-haired woman. Old enough, she could have been my grandmother. The mediator. I've been expecting you. Four men with weapons, I noticed, flanked the old woman. She was clearly someone important. Are you here to make a deal? I gingerly inquired. A truce with an enemy? Nothing of the sort, she claimed beckoning a hand and inviting me into my own office. I'm here on a perfectly legal basis, says the woman who's broken into my office, I argued. She laughed heartily at that. I understand, but I assure you, nothing has been taken. I only wanted to... She gestured around. Ensure you were the real deal. Which context? I asked. I've done many things. Artifacts of the odd kind. She revealed. So she wanted one of the weirder things I've barred off. Something less than human and more ancient. Creepy. Bizarre. Cursed artifacts. Odd devices, that kind. I occasionally deal in the divine. The old woman beckoned for me to take a seat. And so I did. She told her story. The things she had been searching for and the sums of money I would be paid. I'm looking for a very specific painting. She began. A very old one. Painted in 1866. I suppose you don't know of the work of Isabella Corelli. I shook my head. I was not too familiar with the art I dealt with. No. My assistant Stephen dealt with that. Who? She was an artist touched by God. She painted many things in her youth. Boring things. Still life, the things that do not interest me. And one day, she was called by something beyond the veil, and from then on, was possessed by a certain... She thought of the word. Essence, 
that gave her paintings life. The bell rang in the distance. I checked the time. An auction was due to begin in an hour. And I assumed that was Stephen, getting things ready. Look, I don't have all day for an art lesson, lady. Fair. I was a young girl when I saw it. The face of God. Her last and final painting. She answered. This very auction house, when your father ran it, they were selling those artifacts, and I wasn't allowed to see what went on in there. But I hid somewhere and watched. She sighed. And then they unveiled their prize painting, Corelli's face of God, and they screamed. Every single person. I only saw a glimpse of the painting. But it was the greatest thing I had ever witnessed. Sorry, but as I recall, I had read up my father's files a while back. Didn't everyone who saw that painting die? Indeed. The woman confirmed. But that glimpse... It was beautiful, and I am dying anyway, and if I were to die, I would die looking at the face of God. I know you have records on who bought it. I am willing to pay double to whoever made the purchase. It was so magnificent, beautiful, such sublime. Okay, okay, I got it. I concluded. I'll find the painting. Now, I do have an auction to attend to. She had one of the men hand me a briefcase. Anything you need will be funded for. She handed me a card. Call me if you need anything. With that, the woman left, leaving me with a mission and an auction to run. I checked the briefcase. Dangerous or not, the money she offered would set me for life. It wouldn't be too hard to track down a painting, right? One that also massacred 50 people looking to buy the artifact. Stephen? I called. A bumbling old man ran over. I need to find one of those artifacts. It's called The Face of God? Uh, Corelli, you want to mess around with one of those? He warned, eyeing me closely. It isn't for me, I replied. Client, perfectly legal, is willing to pay the owners for it. We just gotta find whomever bought it. And by we, you mean me. Stephen finished. I nodded, then informed him it was an auction my father had done. I'll be right on it. While Stephen went off to check the records, I had a more pressing matter. To deal with the day's auction. But that was easy work. And I could trust one of my many other assistants with it. And the more I thought about the woman and her wishes of death, the longer my mind kept tugging at the name she'd mentioned. Isabella Corelli. I couldn't place it but there was something deeply familiar about that name. It was one of those intuitions you just knew. So I called over a friend of mine, one who had a keener knowledge on those artifacts. He worked at a company that recovered them, and I'd long brokered a deal with him to smuggle some over from time to time, to supplement my business. Quintin, he greeted, picking up my call. How are things over at the auction house? Things are good, Canopy, I responded. If you're calling because I haven't dropped anything by in a while, you're not in luck. Company 7's tightened up on security ever since the Cassie incident. Not anything you should worry about. I shook my head. 
No. Actually, I'm calling because I need information. I confessed. Tell me, old friend. What do you know about the painter, Isabella Corelli? He frowned enough that I could taste the concern, even through my laptop. Nothing good comes from seeking a Corelli, he warned. Best to stay away from the whole painting business. It isn't for me, I explained. I told him about the woman who'd come earlier, and after a full two minutes of practically begging him for information, he took the bait, and quite a lot he said. Corelli's paintings were very... odd in nature. The first of her paintings had been recovered in a little house, destined to be destroyed in a place called Merchante, small enough to not have any useful information about it online, but big enough to make it a notable sight. A couple of teenage explorers found the little house, entered it, found an old weathered sack, and opened it. The paintings, glorious yet wretched things, were inside. The blues had a certain aura of the sea to them, the yellows had an odd dullness, and the reds were bleeding out of the painting. The moment they touched one, the canvas of three teenagers on the beach, the sand as yellow as where they stood, and blues that matched the colour of the sea, the painting started to bleed. The trio, both in life and in art, started to bleed from their eyes, cheeks, hands, everywhere. By the time the police found them, they were unrecognisable husks of muscle and bone. The report was kept hidden away from the public due to its unfathomable nature. My friend Canopy, though, worked for the company responsible for recovering and holding the artefacts in relative safety, hidden from thought and knowledge from the rest of the world. The rest of the paintings found within the little black sack offered similar effects. A friend, though more workplace acquaintance of Canopy's, had been one of the first to recover a Corelli. There was a house across the world in Canada she and her team were sent. The couple who'd been living there were gone. Just gone. Neighbours had noted their disappearance and flagged it with the police. When the police nor higher authorities could not find a cure, and people started to go missing in the area, one by one, someone high up had the idea to call over the company. They arrived. She and her team found the artifact locked away in the heart of the house. The house had changed too, warping from the blueprint they were given to something accursed bigger on the inside and filled with an almost artificial glow. And at the centre of the house they found it. A room, locked away. Inside they discovered the empty frame of a painting. One, according to sources, had been one of a house. But now this house sat on a little table. Plastic. Painted and uncharacteristically childlike. Inside the dollhouse were figures and models of all who had gone missing. All were placed in the back of the rooms, faces frowned, cartoonish, and wearing clothes far too old for the time. The new dollhouse matched the interior of the shifted house. Canopy's friend seized the artifact away, throwing a net of bone silver upon it realigning the house and neutralizing its cursed effects. The victims were never returned, forever bound to the house. I'm just saying, Quinton, he insisted, wagging a finger. You do absolutely do not want to mess with a Corelli. I got it, I got it, I assured. I'll even wear silverback glass. He sighed and signed off. Silverback glass, I hoped, would be enough to shield me from the effects of the painting, had Stephen located it. 
for those unaware of the slang. They are glasses, backed with a newly blessed silver and pressed with iron. I'd use them a few times to block out the effects of some nauseating artwork, and I hoped it would neutralize the painting the old lady wanted. The day quickly passed into the afternoon. Stephen, I called. He came running over, notebook in hand, square glasses in the other. Have you located to whom the face of God was sold to? He smiled. He'd found it. What do you know about Paint and Phillips? I started to answer, but he continued anyway. He's a killer, serial at best, though they never found the evidence required to convict him. And we're in luck. He owns a house just a few miles away. Excellent, I confirmed. I'll take Matt and Asta with us and see if we can strike a deal. I started to walk now, heading to the security slash recoverance team. Judging by recent activity, he may not be there at all, Stephen added. The house looks decrepit, and the neighbor I talked to on Facebook. Really, Stephen? Facebook. And I joked. You can never trust Facebook. Like I was saying, it looks like he hasn't been there in years, Stephen concluded. Are we banking on dead, missing, or... On the run. A lanky man with a crew cart bro nodded me. I'm betting on dead, he announced. What are we betting on? Matt, I greeted. I told him to fetch Asta. Then told him what we were about to do. We haggled on the bonus I'd be giving them. But they agreed once I revealed to them the unlimited funding the old lady had given. I retrieved silverback glasses for the four of us, and, by the hour, we were ready. Another quarter of an hour brought us into a little gated community, where I paid off the lazy security guard, parked our car in front, and observed it. Stephen was right. It didn't look like anyone had been there in years, save for maybe... Judging by a wide open door and the messy scene beyond the windows, reckless hobos or worse, stereotypical teenagers. So, what's so dangerous about this art that we've got to wear silverback? Asta pointed out. I told her it had killed 50 people more than half a century ago. She got the message. We exited the van and entered the house. The place... No offence. Looked like the insides of an uncleaned vacuum cleaner. We coughed at every turn, and we also had no idea if he still had the painting or not. Still, the place was thick with dread, and the implacable fear shot at me like knives. It, by full honesty, was terrifying. I shuddered in fear, wondering what lay within. Luckily, Asta was a canary. Those who had the ability to sense the things beyond normal human perception. Born with an attraction to the uncanny, and a desire to find and, in most cases, destroy. These also worked in the reverse reaction. A canary would be more likely to be hounded and attacked by the whimsical and weird but Asta could put up a hell of a fight. Asta stopped us in our tracks, then pointed to a room, white door closed, yet yearning to be opened. There, she whispered, something powerful, divinely so. Matt led the way, opening the door a crack and pointing his gun inwards. Nothing reacted, and pushed the door open. The room was a sea of endless black, despite the beating sun that had lit the entire house, and the endless void pulsed, and I saw brief shadows inside, 
swirling and reaching out. What the hell? Matt snapped, and thought it was more of an annoyance than fear. Anything that didn't immediately attack us was probably safe. A huge emphasis on probably. There's more than one thing in there. Aster informed, reaching into the void, sensing further. Three things. One powerful, one weak, and one... something more alive than dead. Aster's face drained of colour as she sensed the insides. I dragged her hand out of the void before anything could happen. Canaries were useful, yes, but more drawn to the forces of oddity. Can we dispel this? Stephen retrieved his tablet, signed in and went for his e-library. I think. He swiped to a certain grimoire we'd scanned. Yeah. He said some words I couldn't fathom, then something that started with Xanthanel and ended with Tion and Isha. Within seconds, the darkness dissipated. Stephen was a damn good assistant, yes, but he was an even better sorcerer. Another win for the team auction gang. Matt cheered. We looked at him in confusion. We really need a team name. Stephen rolled his eyes. Let's grab the artifacts and go. We all agreed. The room was white. A clean, sterile white. Splotches of paint dotted the room, and three paintings sat in frames in the centre, floating in place. Enchanted, I assumed. One of the three paintings had, by any description, exploded. This, I assumed, was the cause beyond the still wet splotches of paint. I assume this is your doing, Stephen. Matt calmly murmured. The other man nodded. I noted the two frames. One was covered in cloth, and the other displayed a barren cityscape at night. Lights all but turned off. Even through the silverback, I saw shadows moving within the city, alive in artificial glory. I reached over to uncover the hidden frame. No! Master held me back. I don't think Silverback can protect us from witnessing. She felt the thing through the frame. This. Alright. I agreed. I trusted her. I went around it, checked the back, and sighed in relief as a label announced that it was indeed the face of God. I nodded to the team. We got it. Let's get back and hand it over. Leaving was easier than getting in. A feeling of relief washed over us as Matt covered the artifacts in netting, reducing, though not neutralizing its power. The drive back was peaceful, to our relief. And soon, I was handing the painted cityscape over to Stephen for storage, and meeting with the old lady in the office. Greetings, miss. I shrugged. My name is not important. She laughed, reaching out towards the painting. I drew it back. Despite her age and her genuine tone, I had concerns for why exactly she wanted the artifact. My canary said it's a piece of great power, I raised. Something even silverback glass can't hide. Do you really want to die looking at this thing? Or is this a weapon? She smiled and dismissed her men. My reason for wanting it is genuine. Did you know? She paused, thinking. Corelli once said, Those who observe the painting will be given life anew. I shook my head. No, 
and tell that to over 50 dead patrons. I pointed out. You know, I could just hand this over to the company. She sighed wistfully. They were not ready to behold the wonders of the painter. She murmured. But I am. Something about the way she said that seemed true. And I'm more than willing to pay for it. She snapped her fingers, and her men walked in, placing down an additional four briefcases, filled with money. This is a lot of money you're willing to spend on this. I commented, checking the money, one stack at a time. The debt don't have need for material concerns. She chuckled. And if I am given life anew, I will not be concerned with such finite things. Well, I sighed. At the end of the day, I don't really know anything about Corelli. So, you've got yourself a deal. I extended a hand. She shook it. Thank you, Mr. Loreno. I placed the painting, still covered in cloth, in a box, handed it to her, and away she went. Four briefcases lined my offices, enough to last us a very long time. Another day at the office, perhaps. Enough omission well done. I don't like it, Asta murmured, watching her leave the building. We should have sent it to the company. I handed her a stack of cash. I know you can't say no to ice cream. Still, she hesitated. I don't trust whoever the hell she is. Anyone who wants a Corelli has got to be mad. How the hell does everyone know about Corelli? I stammered, confused and bewildered. Let's just go get ice cream. Let's. Master and I walked out, gathering the team and walked out into the night. Another day done. Another mission complete. Perhaps the artifact would resurface. But perhaps another day. Another time. Now it was time to celebrate. For the fleeting moments of life were the ones we always took for granted. Hello, sinister listeners. If you've enjoyed this story, then you'll find all the author's information in the description below. For more content, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to succumb to the sinister.